Let the church say sovereign. sovereign. In case you wrestle with the definition of sovereignty, here it is. Sovereignty is authority without accountability. Sovereignty is control that can't be challenged. Sovereignty is unfettered power. Sovereignty is the ability to do what you want to do when you feel like doing it and don't ask nobody whether they can give you permission to do it. And when you're done with it, you don't even ask them how they feel about it because you are so sovereign, you can just do whatever you want to do when you feel like doing it. And can't nobody tell you you can't do what you decided to do because nobody can control the authority and the power that you have. And God says, that's who I am. I'm the God that can do what I want to do when I feel like doing it. I ain't going to ask you if you like it. I don't care if you don't want it. I am so much God that I will do whatever I feel like doing. God is sovereign. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Come on and put those hands together. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. And we're going to continue just singing a few hymns together. This is a very simple song in lieu of the pastor's sermon series on names of God, the great I am. Anybody believe he's Jehovah? He's the great I am. He's Emmanuel. So if you just sing this song with us and lift your hands and worship. You are the great. You are the great. The great I am. We give you praise. We give you praise. Forevermore. Forevermore. Come on, you You are the great. The great I am. Great I am. We give you praise. We give you praise. Forevermore. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. And we give you praise forevermore. Oh, 
and enter his courts with praise. Anybody thankful this morning? Thankful unto him, because we came to bless his name. For the Lord is good. He's worthy of all of our praise. Come on. If you're excited to be in God's house, then just put those hands together. As we sing this all good and faithful, Psalm says, enter his gates. Come on, everybody. Enter his gates gates. With thanksgiving Enter his his courts With praise praise. Enter his gates gates. With thanksgiving Enter his his courts With praise praise. Be thankful, come on I say you want to be thankful unto him. Everybody be thankful. thankful unto him. And bless his and name. Bless, bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Say. His, his name. His name. Come on, one more time. Everybody say. Enter his gates. Enter his gates. With thanksgiving. Enter his courts. Enter his courts. 
says be thankful. Anybody thankful? Anybody thankful? Anybody thankful? Everybody thankful. Everybody thankful. Everybody thankful. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Family, I invite you to stand this morning for this morning's scripture. It's found in Psalm 20. We'll read verses 6 through 7 in the New International Version. And it reads, Now this I know. The Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. 
the word of God for the people of God. I invite you this morning, Alpha Street family, as we stand and remember those that are walking through the shadow of death, as we remember the family members of our brothers and sisters who are now in the presence of the Lord, I'll go through the list and I'll invite you to add names as well. We remember the family of Sister Halston, Brother Witherspoon. We remember the family of Brother Horace Murphy and Brother Patrick Burns. And now I invite you to mention names that you'd like to lift as well. Father, we stretch our hands to thee. God, there's no other help we know that if you would draw thyself from us, whither shall we go? We pray this morning, Father, for those that are experiencing grief all over the world. We pray for those that are experiencing grief in our communities and in our families. Father, I pray that you would be with them just as you promised in scripture. I pray today, Father, for those that are experiencing their own troubles in life. God, that you would even look upon them. I invite your spirit even now in this room, Holy Spirit. Fill this place. Move from heart to heart. Move from breast to breast. Lord, we invite you to have your way, Lord. We thank you for our service this morning. We ask God that you would be with your manservant today. God, remember Pastor Wesley as he stands to declare your word of life today. I pray God that your word would come forth and accomplish everything that you sent it out to accomplish. Father, I pray for my brother and my sister this morning that is standing all over this room. And some that are not able to stand. God, we remember them and their prayer request this morning. We plead with you today, God. Remember us, O oh Lord. And God, we'll continue to give your name the glory. We'll continue to give your name the honor. And we'll continue to give your name the praise. God, that's not hard because truthfully you are worthy. And you're worthy of it all. So Father, we close this prayer with the sound of amen and amen and amen. This morning I invite you to join royal priesthood for this morning's hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Bedford Street, I invite you to participate in passing the peace. Alfred Street. To our guests who bless us with the presence of God as you gather with us in worship today, to our family and friends around the world wide web who connect with us virtually, grace and peace be unto each and every one of you. From God who loves us as a mother and a father, and Jesus Christ, who always and alone is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning, and our returning Redeemer. I welcome you to this, our summer hour of power worship service, where we believe that in 60 minutes we can gather in and get a full dose of giving God glory and the word of God. And that God is pleased when we enjoy the abundant life that he's given unto us in the gift of this day that awaits us. I welcome you all to this 8 a.m. worship service. We take a moment now to pause in the breaking of bread and sharing of cup, reminding ourselves of how the Lord has called us into community with one another. We have an open communion at Alfred Street that we celebrate with all who confess and believe and Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you did not receive the elements of the Lord's Supper when you entered, if you just wave a hand, there are deacons who will gladly serve you this morning. To our family online, we invite you to take this moment to lay hold of the bread and the cup you will use to join in with us as we remind ourselves that we are all sinners saved by the grace of God. It's amazing that when Jesus instituted this Lord's Supper, he waited until he had all the disciples together at the table. It's always amazing to me that even Judas was there. Now, if it had been me, I would have waited until Judas had left the room. <laughs> but even Judas is invited as a reminder that none of us are perfect, and that through this bread and cup, the Lord reminds us that we are connected to one another. You cannot be at your best in Christ by yourself. God calls us into family, into relationship, and this bread and this cup reminds us that we need one another. No matter how big your Bible is, no matter how anointed your prayers are, no matter how many tongues you talk in, you need your brother and your sister to be at the best God has created us to be. It's a remembrance of that community that we've called and created in Christ that we take bread together. And we eat of this bread which represents the broken body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus who alone is our Christ. He was crucified, he died, he was buried. He is resurrected, he is risen. He is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercessions for our sins and one day to the glory of God, he is returning. Let us break bread and eat together.
In the cup is the memorial of the blood shed on the cross of Calvary for the remission of our sins and the redemption of our souls. This week I've paused to meditate on all the hymns about the blood of Jesus. And I love that one that declares it reaches. There's some hymn folk in here. To the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. The blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, let us drink together. Pray with me, family. God, I thank you for doing for me what I never could have done for myself. And through our faith, we receive what you offer in your grace. The complete forgiveness of sin the eternal security of our salvation, the precious indwelling power of the Holy Spirit to call us to live a life that is pleasing in your sight. And Lord, we embrace the commandment and commission we have to share your love and to make more disciples. You love us, God, now may we learn to love one another. And as you've forgiven us, may we truly forgive each other. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Beloved, we are thankful that God's presence is in this place, not only through the praise that we lift up, but through the presence of those who we honor today. The Bible teaches us that guests in our midst are God, God's angelic presence among us. It's amazing to me how we oftentimes miss that God's greatest displeasure with God's people in the Old Testament was in how they failed to treat strangers with the love of God. It was not about worshiping idol gods. It was not about what they named as sin. It was not about whether they went to church on time. It's the fact that they could not celebrate God's presence in the face of a stranger. Today, we honor those who are not part of our family as guests today because we believe that you are part of God's family and we welcome you. If you're a guest of Alpha Street and you don't mind us recognizing you, we just put a hand in the air as we thank God for our guests at this early service. Alpha Street, help me bless God for our family and friends today. Welcome. To those watching online, we invite you even in this moment as we worship with you to just chat and let us know where you're from. We're grateful to God for the opportunity we have to worship across this entire globe to make glorious the name of Jesus Christ. There's some people we celebrate today because God's given them another year of life and they are here knowing that it is only of the Lord's mercies that they are not consumed. If you put another candle on your cake and you know to God be the glory because you could have, should have, and maybe would have lost it, but the Lord kept you through another 12 months, I'm going to ask all our birthdays to stand that we may celebrate those who are celebrating a year of life. Congratulations. Welcome. Welcome. Help me honor God through birthdays today. Happy birthday to each and every one of you. And finally, we honor God's presence in the gift of love. If there are any couples who are celebrating another year of anniversary, of wedding, of marital bliss, or making, just marital making it, amen. Uh, uh, amen. You, sometimes you just got to hold on. Um, if you've got another anniversary, we're going to ask that you would stand and remain standing for a moment. That we may celebrate anniversaries. All our anniversaries stand. And Alpha Street, help me thank God for the gift of love in this place. Please remain standing. We ask you to remain standing because we call out anniversary years to know what we're celebrating. How many, Deacon Moore, how many of you all celebrating? 26, congratulations on your 26th anniversary. My brother and my sister, how many years? Five years, congratulations on five years of marriage. How many years you all got together? 22, congratulations on your 22nd anniversary. How many years you celebrating? 29, congratulations on 29. And to our guests here today, we just met. Tell me how many years you are celebrating? 50. 50, congratulations on 50 years, amen. The Lord is able. Listen, we're going to get ready for the word of God in song as Royal Priest is going to come and bless us with really is one of my favorite songs in all the kingdom of Christ today. Um, as they're coming, I want to remind you just a few things. One, that 
uh, Brothers Keepers coming up. For those that do not know that, that's one of our great mission programs where we believe that we are called to bless those in our community with all that they need, especially our children, and getting ready for school. It's amazing how quickly the summer has come and gone. But Brothers Keeper is July 22nd, begins at 8 o'clock. You can go online to find out more information about how you may volunteer or even more how you may contribute. That being said, you know that we are dependent upon your prayers and your generosity as you obey the Holy Spirit and the call to give. Simply asking you to use the online platforms that are available to you and to be prayerful about what God has enabled and blessed you to give and to surrender. We don't lift up a formal offering at Alpha Street because we believe that you're mature enough to do the right thing inside and outside of the sanctuary. So we encourage you not only in this space, but also online to be faithful in your giving. Then finally, I'm gonna ask you to help us make certain we're a church. If we can for just a moment, we passed the peace of God a moment ago and you met some folk who are sitting around you and I just believe that there's always someone who needs a prayer request of someone who's going to pray for them. So before the choir sings, do me a favor, lean over to someone left and right and simply ask them, is there anything I can pray for you this week? And we will take that to God in prayer this week. Ask them what you can pray for. Now do me a favor, do me a favor. So often when we meet people, we say we'll pray for them as a way of just ending the conversation and getting them on their way. The person God just put into your presence, they gave you a prayer request. Let's make sure we lift it up before the Lord this week. So that next week when we gather in this space and you see them, they'll give you the testimony of what God has done. Come on, let's hear the word of God in song, and then we receive the word of God in sermon, and then we go out and live the word of God as we change the world.
Pray with me, family. What a mighty God. That we serve. And God, we're grateful that everything you do, you do it well. Lord, I pray that you teach someone today to trust that you do it well. It doesn't look like it, doesn't feel like it right now, but you do it well. And we trust you, O oh God. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Family, you know that last week we began our summer sermonic study to examine a few of the more than 60 plus names of God that are written in scripture. We reminded ourselves last week as we began this journey of the words of God who command us in the third of the Ten Commandments to not take the name of the Lord in vain. I tried to share with you that that is much more than God's prohibition from putting a four-letter curse at the end of the name God, but rather a reminder that there is something special, yea, even sacred in the names of God. And one of the reasons this series is so important is that every name of God is really a gracious invitation from God for you to know God more deeply and more personally. That our God says, I want you to know me in full. And in each and every name is an opportunity you for to see and to strengthen and to grow your knowledge and your relationship of the God you serve. That the names are also the possibilities of the power of God that there is power in the name of the Lord. God says, don't use my name as if it is worthless or useless. But understand that something happens when you call on the name of the Lord. And that each and every name is an opportunity to trust God more. The names of God, Deacon Easter, are not just names, they are promises of what God said God will do and who God will be. Jehovah Jireh ain't a name, it's a promise. That when you find yourself with nothing else you can count on, God says, I'll provide for you. Jehovah Rapha is not a name, it's a promise. When the doctor says they found something, don't you sweat, don't you lose your, your grip of life, don't you jump off a bridge, because God is a healer. I want to continue on in that study, and I'm going to invite you as you're physically able to stand and turn in your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. It's my prayer that it doesn't take you long to find Exodus, <laughs> chapter 3. As you're turning there, any good study of the names of God has to begin in Exodus, chapter 3. It is there you'll find that God has summoned Moses to a burning bush that God may give him an assignment on his life. Moses has never met God, and in response to the call, Moses has a question. And the question is, what's your name? And I want you to hear the only place in all of Bible where God self-identifies with a name. This is the only place in all 66 books where God says, here's my name. Moses asked, what's your name? Listen to God's answer, beginning in verse 13. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What then shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I am that I am. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Professor 
Terrence Fritham, an Old Testament professor out of Minnesota, has suggested that God's reply to Moses is one of the most cryptic and difficult verses in the entire Bible. Listen to what he says, and I quote, thousands of pens have been broken and millions of gallons of ink spilled trying to interpret I am. I want to unpack some of the problem that you might see the power in the name that God gives Moses to encourage us in our daily living. In order for you to understand it, I need your patience as I take you down the halls of seminary and take a moment to show you and teach you some Hebrew. We'll get to the preaching for a moment, but let's stretch our minds. Y'all want to learn some Hebrew? Moses asked God, what's your name? Our Bible says that God's answer is, I am. In the original Hebrew, which is going to show up on the screen, the name that God gives Moses is called the Tetragrammaton. Will you please put it up? Everyone say it with me, Tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton. Say it one more time, Tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton. I want you to impress your coworkers tomorrow. <laughs> Tetra meaning four, grammaton meaning letters. Tetragrammaton is technically the seminary term for the four-letter name of God that God gives in response to Moses' question. It shows up right there in Hebrew. I know it's tough to see in English. I mean, in Hebrew, I'll tell you, teach to you in English in a moment, but the Tetragrammaton, four-letter word of God. Those are four Hebrew letters. If you go to the next slide, in order to teach you some things about Hebrew, you got to remember two things. First of all, Hebrew reads from right to left, not left to right. And as you see the Tetragrammaton, the first letter is Yod, which we transliterate in English as Y. The second one is He, that we transliterate as H. The third one is Vav, that we transliterate as W. And the last one is He again, which is H in English. Y H. W H. When God tells Moses, I am, God's answer is Y H W H in Hebrew, which you have learned to pronounce as Yahweh. Pause because that may not be how you actually pronounce it. But we've taken Y H W H to be Yahweh. God's answer, the Tetragrammaton, Y H W H, Yod. Hey, Vav, Hey is what we translate as Yahweh. The first thing you got to know is that Hebrew reads from right to left. The second thing you need to know is that in the original Hebrew, there are no vowels. It's all consonants. Vowels came between the 7th and the 11th century by Masorite scribes who came back and added vowels that we might learn how to pronounce the words correctly. So let me give you an example if you go to the next screen. There's a word in Hebrew, remember it reads from left to left, right to left, Melek Lamed Kof, which we would translate as MLK, not Martin Luther King. Uh, <laughs> um, we would translate that MLK. Well, there are no vowels in it. The vowels came later by Masorite scribes and their vowel points that are added. And so you'll see those dots around those dots underneath the letters represent vowels, and so when we add the vowels in, M-L-K becomes M-E-L-E-K, which is melek, which is the term king. The vowel points were added to help us understand how to pronounce it correctly. Are you with me? Hebrew reads from right to left. God's answer is yod, hey, vav, hey, w, I mean, y, h, w, h, and then the vowel points come later. It's all going to make sense in a minute. Okay. The name God gives is Y-H-W-H. What may surprise you, the next slide will show you, is that the answer God gives, Y-H-W-H, shows up in the Hebrew Bible, your Old Testament, 6,828 times. What you translate as Yahweh 
the Tetragrammaton in the original Hebrew Bible shows up 6,828 times. Now, Frankie, here's the problem. If God's answer is Yahweh, how come your Bible never translates it as Yahweh? Yahweh shows up 6,828 times in the Hebrew Bible, but you only see it once in your Bible in, he, in Exodus chapter 3. As a matter of fact, no one even prays using the term I am. There's no prayer in the Bible that calls God I am. Why is it that if God says my name is W-H-W-Y-H-W-H, the Tetragrammaton, would you say Yahweh? How come you don't see that in your Bible? How come that's not the name we call God? How come you don't see it over and over again? It's there 6,828 times, but in our English Bibles, we don't see it. What's the gap? How come we don't pray and say, I am, when we pray? How come the Jews don't call God Yahweh? Why is that name not shown up as many times in our practice as it is in Scripture? Do you see the problem? The reason... Yahweh does not show up, W-A-Y-H-W-H, the Tetragrammaton, all goes back to Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, where God says, don't take my name in vain. And what happened is that Moses goes back and says, this is the name God gave. Then God comes back and says, wait, don't use that name casually. And because of that, even though it shows up so much in Scripture, the Jews held that name so sacred that they were careful how they used it. So when they're writing scripture, because you know there were no Xerox machines, there were no scanners, the only way that they could copy scripture was to write it. When they were writing scripture and they came across Yahweh 6,828 times in the Bible, let me tell you what they did. When they saw Yahweh, they did one of three things. Sometimes they just left it blank. They wouldn't even write it. It'd just be a gap in the scriptures where there was a space and you knew that that was where the name Yahweh used to be. But Yahweh is so sacred that they wouldn't even write it in scripture. Or you'll find out, how many of you all have ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Dead Sea Scrolls were some ancient uh, Hebrew Bible manuscripts that were found. And the, the scribes back in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, when they came across Yahweh, Deacon Easter, they wouldn't write W-Y-H-W-H. They would just put four dots. Why? Because the name was so sacred to even write it was to take it in vain. Or more commonly, when they saw the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, they wouldn't, they would leave a space, they'd write four dots, or they would replace it with another term, Adonai. Adonai means Lord. And so watch this in your Bible, in your Old Testament, whenever you see capital L, capital R, capital R, capital D, that is where Adonai was put in to replace Yahweh because Yahweh was too sacred to even write. So wherever you see the capital L, capital R, capital D, that's where Adonai is, and that's where Yahweh used to be, and we replaced it with Lord because we couldn't write Yahweh. It was too sacred. Not only did the Jews hold it so sacred that they wouldn't write it, but we know for certain after the Jews came back from the exile in Babylon, they wouldn't even say the name. So, Kushan, they would be reading in scripture and they get to where the Tetragrammaton was and they wouldn't pronounce that because even to say that name off your lips is blasphemy. Unholy lips cannot say Yahweh, and to this day, Jews will never say Yahweh. That's not a name that comes off of lips that understand you cannot take the name of God in vain. They would not speak the name I am. Can I teach Bible real quick? That's why the Pharisees had such an issue with Jesus. You read in the Gospel of John, he's arguing with them one day in John chapter 8, and Jesus has the audacity to say this, before Abraham was, I am. And when the Pharisees heard Jesus say, I am, their ears rang with Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7 said, you can't say that name. And they wanted to kill him because he used the name I am. You do not say 
Yahweh. What did they say? They replaced it with the term Jehovah. Now, now, I'm about, I'm about to get to preaching, finish teaching real quick. Jehovah is not the name God gave. God gave Y-H-W-H, the Tetragrammaton. Why y'all calling me Jehovah? That ain't what I told you my name was. And Jehovah, this is going to blow your mind, is not even an original Hebrew word. Jehovah does not show up in the original Bible. So here you are saying, Jehovah, Shammah, that ain't even in the Bible. Where do we get Jehovah from? Y'all ready to learn something? In an attempt to keep reverence to the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, what the Jews did was that they took the vows, because remember there were no vows, they took the vows from Adonai and added them into the Tetragrammaton. Boy, this is a Bible study. They took the vows out of Adonai and inserted it into Y-H-W-H. Go to the next screen so you'll see what happens. They took the name Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, took the vowels A, O, and A, and inserted them into Yahweh. So Y, A, H, O, W, A, H. Sound it out. Yehovah. Yahweh. You know what Jehovah is? Jehovah is an attempt to keep sacred the Tetragrammaton by adding in the vows of Adonai, Lord, which is why sometimes you see the name Lord God together because it's Lord and God. It's Adonai and Yahweh. It turns into Jehovah because Jehovah is simply taking the name Yahweh and adding the vows of Adonai. So don't let some black Israelite trip you up talking about Jehovah ain't even in the Bible. No, we know it ain't in the Bible. It's taking Adonai and Yahweh and adding it together so that we can keep sacred the name that God gave to Moses because we don't say Yahweh, we say Jehovah. Moses says, what's your name? God gives the Tetragrammaton. That name God gives is meant to teach them something about God. It's meant to teach them, number one, that God is sovereign. Let the church say sovereign. Sovereign. That tetragrammaton, that Y-H-W-H is God's way of saying, I am sovereign. Listen, the best way to understand sovereignty, sovereignty is authority without accountability. A sovereignty is unfettered power. Sovereignty is control that can't be challenged. Sovereignty is the ability to do whatever you want to do whenever you feel like doing it, however you want to get it done, and you ain't got to ask nobody for permission to do whatever you want to do. So when God says, I am, God is saying to us, remember this, I am sovereign, and I can do whatever I want to do when I feel like doing it, how I want to do it. You ain't got to like it. You ain't got to vote on it. You ain't got to shout about it. I'm so much God that I will do whatever I feel like doing when I feel like doing it because I am sovereign. Moses asked for a name. God doesn't give a name. God says, I am. Because Zena, in the ancient world, knowing a name gave you the misperception that you controlled what you could name. Come on, come on. So when Adam is in the garden, what is the first thing God tells him he's got to do over creation? Give it names. Because if you name it, you can control it. So God says, I ain't giving you a name. Because y'all got the tendency to think that if you can name me, you can control me. Well, I don't know who I can't appreciate about what you know. We cannot control God. Our words don't control God. Our prayers don't control God. Our expectations don't control God. Your praise don't control God. Your attendance in church doesn't control God. Your reading Bible doesn't control God. Your acting righteous doesn't control God. You can do all of that, and God is still going to do whatever God wants to do in, with, and through your life. 
I don't care how holy you pretend to be and act to be. You cannot control God. And when God moves, God doesn't send you a survey to ask if you like it. God says, you can't control me. I'm not giving you a name. Can I push it? Moses says, what's your name? God says, I am. T, it's almost like God is being nice nasty. <laughs> watch, watch, I'm, I'm giving to an Ebonic. Um, <laughs> what's your name? Me. <laughs> it's almost as if God said, my name ain't none of your business. God, what's your name? I am. Because God understands if I give you a name, you will try to limit and lock me in that name. Watch this. And there's no human name that really fits all that I am. Whatever name I give you, I'm bigger than that. Beloved, can I tell you what one of the great sins of contemporary Christianity is? Is that we have forgotten that God is bigger than any name we want to put on God. And God cannot be locked and limited into any name you give God. God is bigger than your doctrine. God is bigger than your politic. God is bigger than your Bible. God is bigger than your denomination. God is bigger than your church. God is bigger than your titles. God is bigger than your position. There's no name you give God that fits God. God ain't white. And God ain't black because God is bigger than race. God is not evangelical, and God is not liberal, because God is bigger than your doctrine. God is not cis, God is not trans, and God is not queer, because God is bigger than any title you want to put on God. God is not male, and God is not female, because God is bigger than gender. God is not Methodist, God ain't Baptist, God ain't Pentecostal, because God is bigger than your religion. Wait, and God ain't American either, because God is bigger than your country. And every time we try to lock God into a name, God says, I am. I am sovereign. I'm too big to be controlled. I am says God is sovereign. You know what else it says? I am says God is holy. Somebody say holy. holy. Uh, here's what will blow your mind. God's answer to Moses, this tetragrammaton, this I am, is the only place in all cultures and religions where that name shows up. The reason that's important is because there are those who do cross-religious studies to see the commonalities between religions that were formed in the Middle East. And religions that were formed in the Middle East have some commonalities. Yes, they do. Mel, there are commonalities in Holy Scriptures. The story of the flood and don't just show up in Genesis, it shows up in other religions. Not only are there commonalities in scriptures, there are commonalities in names. The term El that we're going to talk about, Elohim, El Shaddai, El, El ain't unique to Christianity. Other religions have El. And let me help you, Allah ain't exclusive to Muslims. Allah is just an Arabic term for God. Even Christians from Arabic countries refer to God as Allah. Allah is not exclusively Islam, but the only place where Yahweh shows up, the only religion where this name is given is right here. There's only one, this one, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this one who opened up the Red Sea, this one who carried them through the wilderness, this one who gave them the promised land, this one who came down and died on a cross and rose on the third day. This is the only God by that name. God is saying, ain't nobody like me. Can I preach right here? 
Uh, so when Moses shows up and asks God, and God said, listen, first, before we get this straight, you got to take your shoes off. Uh, why? Because you're standing on holy ground. Where I am is holy. Watch this. The word holy is this Hebrew word kadesh. And, and kadesh may not mean what you think it is. Holy is much more than just perfect. Holy is much more than not being sinful. Holy is much more than being righteous. Can I tell you what holy literally means when you translate it? Holy literally means apart. You know what holy means? Different. You know what holy really means? Ain't nothing like me. Holy means I am the one and the only and there ain't nothing like me. So when God says, I am, what God is telling Israel and telling us is, I am holy. Ain't nothing like me. I'm different than anything you will ever know. I'm different than anything you will ever experience. There's nothing you will ever encounter that's like God. I feel like preaching myself right here that there's nobody like God. Can't nobody do for me what God can do for me. Because there's only one God and he is holy. So when we sing that term, that hymn, holy, 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 that we stole from the angels in Isaiah, what we're really saying is different, 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 this God is different. He's not like anything you ever know. Huh, huh. That's why, watch this, God says to them, I love the way God works. He gives them the Ten Commandments. And watch what he says. He says, I'm God. Brought you out of Egypt. Don't get it flipped. Don't you mess that up. Don't use my name in vain. And the middle one, don't make any graven images. You know why? Because ain't nothing you can make with your hands that looks like who I am. I don't look like no eagle. You can make a snake, that ain't me. Anything you try to make to look like God is idolatry. Ah, Judy, I feel like teaching. Because we have mistakenly assumed that idolatry is only when we take something and try to make it look like a God. So we teach that, that you can lift up things and try to place them where God belongs, and that's idolatry. You can make your marriage an idol your children, an idol, your job, an idol, your church, an idol, your pastor. <laughs> I tried. Uh, that you can lift them up to him as God. I would suggest to you that that's only one form of idolatry. The worst form of idolatry is not when we take something from here and try to lift it up to God. The worst form of idolatry is when we take God out of God's magnificence and try to make God look like us. Idolatry is we want God to be like us. Idolatry is when you think God thinks like you think. Idolatry is when you want God to vote the way you vote. Idolatry is when you want God to call them the same name you call them. Idolatry is when you want God to put them in hell because you thought they ought to go to hell. Idolatry is when you bring God down and make God like us. And I came by to give an amen that God ain't like us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God is not petty like us. God is not unforgiving like us. God is not prejudiced like us. God is not bigoted like us. God is not racist like us. God is not misogynistic like us. God is not homophobic like us. God is not like us. God is holy. I, I got to go. I got to go. Uh, God is sovereign. I am. God is holy. I am. I'm different. You know what else Moses finds out? That God is eternal. I am. What, watch this, y'all. There, and I love this, and I'm going to preach to you because you're my friend. Uh, <laughs> Moses asks for a name. God gives an action. Right. Deb, Moses says, give me a noun. 
God says, I'm going to give you a verb. Yes. Yes. You, you, you're you about to catch it. Uh, yes. uh, yes. Give, give me a person, place, a thing. Yes. God says, no, why don't I give you an action? Because I am an active God. Here's how you're going to know me. Not by a name somebody gave you. You're going to know me by what I do for you. That the way you're going to find out who I am is when you trust in me. And watch what I am able to do in your life. Oh, there's somebody in this sanctuary. The reason you worship God ain't because of what your Sunday school teacher taught you. But when you trusted in God, God showed you who I am. He made a way out of no way. He answered your prayers. He kept your life together. He watched over your children. He blessed your household. He healed your body. And I know him by what he's done. Is there anybody on a Sunday morning that can say, I know what God has shown me? I am what I am. I'll do what you need me to do. I'll be what you need me to be. And you won't find out until you need me like that. But when you need me like that, you'll find out that I'm able to be whatever you need me to be. I got, I'm done. It's, it's 9 o'clock. You're going to judge me. It's a verb. But watch this, and everybody's not going to get this. It's in the imperfect tense. Marcus, i got to teach the Bible. Because imperfect it's a very special verb form that indicates an unfinished action. Okay, here's imperfect. It's something that started in the past. It's being worked out in the present, but won't be finished till the future. <laughs> well, just one hour of power. Uh, it, it, an imperfect verb started yesterday. It's, it's working out today, but it won't be finished till tomorrow. Imperfect means, listen, don't limit what I'm doing to what you see right now. Because whatever you see right now, I started back then. I'm still working it out right now. But if you'll just trust me a little while longer, I'm going to finish it in your tomorrow. Goodbye, saints. But that's the God I serve. He's working it out. He's moving in time. He's not done yet. I'm, I'm done. Oh. The worst thing you can do is lock God into a moment and not realize that God is bigger than what you see right now. God is working in what you don't perceive just yet. My saints, that's going to encourage somebody because every now and then, your right now don't look too good. Every now and then, today don't feel so good. Every now and then, this moment ain't what I prayed for. But God says I'm bigger than that moment. I'm bigger than the storm. I'm bigger than the diagnosis. I'm bigger than the trouble. And if you trust me, I will. I will. And now, unto him who is able to do exceeding and abundance above all, to him be the glory. I am that I am. Lord, I thank you that when we ask you who you are, your answer is I'm sovereign. Your answer is I'm holy. Your answer is I'm eternal. 
God, I pray today that someone would learn to trust that you are still in control. That nothing and no one can question your authority. God, I pray that someone come to believe that you are just different. That others may have failed and betrayed and deceived, but God will never treat you like someone else. And God, you are eternal. You started yesterday. You're working it out today. And you'll finish on tomorrow. The great I am. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Beloved, as we, as we get ready to dismiss from this place, the choir comes, do me a favor. If you want to know more about this great I am, this God who is sovereign and holy and eternal, even if you're online, all you got to do is fill out that form. Let us know who you are. We'll share with you how much God wants you back into the family of grace. There'll be deacons at the altar and in the narthex. All you gotta do is tap them on the shoulder, let them know you wanna give your life to Christ. Do me a favor, leave this place carrying the word of God, be faithful in your giving. Help us to continue to make glorious the name of Jesus Christ. Let's get ready to leave in the grace and the peace of God. the all wise, the eternal, the sovereign, the faithful and omnipotent God who alone is creator of heaven and earth. To the God who's made himself perfectly known to us in Jesus who alone is our Christ, our loving Lord, our sacrificial savior, our resurrected, risen, reigning, returning redeemer. To the God who chooses to dwell in these earthen vessels of clay through the power, promise, presence, purpose, and person of the Holy Spirit. To that all wise God, give you glory and majesty, dominion and power from now until eternity. And the redeemed of the Lord who loved the Lord and awaited his return, said amen. God, and may the grace of God go with you.